Hi, I'm Ken Grauer, and I'm here with another installment of my ECG video blog. As always, I welcome your comments, feedback, and questions. The ECG in the figure was obtained from a 50-year-old man with chest pain. Unfortunately, no other clinical information is available. So, let's interpret this tracing systematically and then review the most important diagnostic considerations. I'll begin with a few comments on my general approach for interpreting any ECG I encounter. I favor use of a two-step approach, with the two steps being descriptive analysis and the clinical impression. My purpose for specifying that there should be two steps to ECG interpretation is in the hope that interpreters won't jump to the second step before completing the first. There's a tendency with tracings like the one shown here to jump at the obvious finding, which here is the very deep T-wave inversion that is seen in multiple leads. But there are other important findings on this tracing that would be all too easy to overlook if one isn't using a two-step systematic approach. Step one is easy. It's purely descriptive, without any analysis. One simply assesses in sequence the six key parameters of ECG interpretation, which are rate, rhythm, intervals, axis, chamber enlargement, and assessment of QRSD changes. It is only after you have completed descriptive analysis that one should turn one's attention to specifics of the case at hand to formulate a clinical impression. Routine use of a two-step systematic approach to every ECG you encounter helps to organize your thinking while at the same time preventing you from overlooking any important findings. Even if you're not certain of the meaning of everything you see, you won't miss important findings, and you'll be able to instantly present the important ECG findings you see in logical fashion. A final benefit is that using a systematic approach will actually speed up your interpretation because you have an easy to remember checklist to sequentially follow. Note, there are variations to the system I present in the table. It's fine if you prefer a slight modification in your approach, but regardless if you use my system or some other, it's essential to always assess intervals before looking at axis, chamber enlargement, and QRST changes. The reason for this is that we need to know early on if a conduction defect such as bundle branch block is present, since criteria and the clinical significance of axis, hypertrophy, and QRST changes of infarction and ischemia change if the QRS complex is wide. Let's now apply these comments to interpreting this tracing, beginning with descriptive analysis. The rhythm is sinus at a rate of about 60 per minute. The PR and QRS intervals are normal, that is, the PR interval is not more than a large box in duration, and the QRS duration is not more than half a large box in duration. Despite the dramatic T-wave appearance, the QTC, that is, the QT interval corrected for heart rate, does not appear to be long. At most, I would estimate the QTC to be no more than 0.44 seconds. In general, the QTC is normal if less than 0.44 second, and clinical concern from QT prolongation is usually minimal with values below 0.50 second. Since the computer is usually quite accurate for determining intervals, it's fine if you simply look on the computerized report for the QTC. Alternatively, the QTC is usually within the normal range if the QT that you measure is not more than half the R to R interval. This eyeball method usually works well when the heart rate is not overly fast. 
that is not more than 90 to 100 or so per minute. The QT that we measure on this tracing is clearly not more than half the R to R interval. Continuing with our descriptive analysis, the axis is normal, approximately plus 20 degrees. Voltage for LVH is clearly present with overlap between QRS complexes in leads V4, V5, and V6. Regarding QRST changes, there are no Q waves. R wave progression shows normal transition. That is, the R wave becomes taller than the S wave is deep between leads V2 to V3. The most notable change on this tracing is the extremely deep and symmetric T wave inversion that nearly attains 10 millimeters in depth in leads V5 and V6. A proportionally comparable degree of T wave inversion considering relative QRS amplitude, is also seen in four of the limb leads. Note coving of the ST segments without significant ST elevation in many of these leads with T-wave inversion. There is also 1 to 2 millimeters of J-point ST depression in the lateral chest leads prior to the deep T-wave inversion. Finally, there is 1 to 2 millimeters of upward sloping, that is smiley shape, ST elevation in leads V1 and V2. Let's now put these findings together to formulate our clinical impression. To summarize what we've noted thus far, the ECG shows sinus rhythm at about 60 per minute with LVH and ST segment coving with deep symmetric T wave inversion in multiple leads. At the least, this ST-T wave appearance is consistent with LV strain and or ischemia. And since this 50-year-old man is having chest pain, this ECG picture certainly could reflect an acute cardiac event. But it's also possible that the ECG picture we see is not new, but long-standing without any acute change. We simply cannot tell from the single ECG alone. So clinical correlation, including careful history, clinical exam, lab and echo findings, and ideally comparison with prior tracings on this patient, will all be needed to determine if these ECG findings are new, and if so, what they might mean. That said, there's another aspect to this case, namely that the T waves on this ECG are giant T waves, which are said to exist when the depth of T wave inversion clearly exceeds five millimeters in at least several leads. The reason this classification is helpful is that it focuses our attention to considering the list of clinical entities most commonly associated with the syndrome of giant T wave inversion, which I show in the table. It should be obvious that more information is needed to hone in on the above differential diagnostic list. That said, close scrutiny of the ECG shown can help us to narrow down our diagnostic considerations. The fact that this patient is having chest pain suggests that he is alert. This goes a long way toward eliminating a CNS catastrophe as the cause. In addition, CNS catastrophes typically produce marked QT prolongation, which is clearly not present in this case. T wave inversion following sustained tachycardia may be seen in multiple leads, but it usually is not as deep as seen here. Even though historical information is limited, the presenting complaint of this patient is chest pain and not shortness of breath, as would be expected if there was massive acute pulmonary embolism. In addition, acute right heart strain most typically manifests with maximal T wave inversion in leads V1, V2, V3, which is not the picture seen in this ECG. This essentially leaves us with a differential diagnosis of marked LVH, especially the apical form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy versus diffuse ischemia or some combination of the two. There clearly is voltage for LVH. Although there is some ST elevation in leads V1 and V2, the amount of ST elevation is minimal and 
upward sloping in shape. Both ST segment and T wave morphology in leads V1 and V2 is virtually the mirror image opposite of the J point ST depression, ST segment coving, and T wave inversion seen in all lateral leads. This makes an acute STEMI, ST elevation acute MI, extremely unlikely and strongly suggests that the ST T wave appearance in leads V1 and V2 is most consistent with a reciprocal ST-T wave picture of LV strain. Bottom line, the ECG shows sinus rhythm, LVH, and giant T wave inversion consistent with ischemia and or LV strain. Clinical correlation is clearly essential, but awareness of the most important entities associated with giant T-wave inversion goes a long way toward narrowing down diagnostic possibilities. An echocardiogram would be revealing regarding LV function. The presence or absence of any wall motion abnormality, as would be expected if there was an acutely evolving cardiac event, as well as the echo being revealing regarding the possibility of any underlying dilated or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Comparison with a prior tracing would be invaluable for determining whether or not the ST-T wave changes seen are new or long-standing. That said, while one cannot rule out the possibility of ischemia that could be acute on the basis of this single ECG, my hunch is that the changes we see may well be long-standing and not reflective of any acute process. That's it for today. I hope that this case has been interesting for you. As always, your comments and feedback are welcome. This is Ken Grauer saying, Goodbye for now.